This is The Antidote with Dave Hawkins, where Christian music doesn't suck. was Hold On from the debut album Broken Compass by Sleepwave. If you're not aware of this band but think that voice sounds familiar, it's for a good reason. Sleepwave's frontman has been in the music scenes since before he was a teen. And during his late teens, Spencer Chamberlain became the vocalist of one of the most popular metal bands ever, Under Oath. Well, Spencer was really cool about meeting with The Antidote for a talk, even though he was busy that day moving to New York City. Now, I'd really intended to speak with Spencer just about the rock music of Sleepwave, but with Under Oath joining together again for a new tour, our conversation ended up covering both bands. 
So tonight you'll hear music from Sleepwave, and since Under Oath is going to perform the entirety of Define the Great Line and their only chasing safety on this tour, we're going to have tracks from both of those albums. Enjoy this really interesting conversation with Spencer Chamberlain. Spencer Chamberlain is one incredibly talented and super busy guy, being both the front man for Under Oath and his new project, Sleepwave. Spencer, thanks a lot for coming on The Antidote. Man, thanks for having me, dude. When we last met, Sleepwave was on tour supporting Norma Jean on their Oh God, The Aftermath anniversary tour. But after leading Under Oath, wasn't it tough for you to sort of stash your ego and take a supporting role? Uh, I mean, not really for me. I think just knowing that like, I wasn't writing for Under Oath and I wasn't writing anything that sounded like Under Oath, I knew what it was going to be. You know, I wanted to do something for myself. I wanted to write something that was different, uh, more, you know, melody and song structure based stuff that I grew up on things, you know, there's plenty of different sides of my musical taste and knowing that wouldn't be an automatic, you know, all the under oath fans are going to come along or, or any of those things were definitely was not expected. So I'm a very firm believer in there's no shortcuts and, and that's especially in the music industry. And I think that bands that are big for the wrong reasons because maybe your past band or there's a famous member from, you know, he was an actor or something or anything, anything out of the ordinary, I think is never for the best. I think shortcuts mean you might rise faster, but that means you're going to fall faster. So I'm totally fine with, uh, you know, sleep wave starting from the bottom, you know, and, and working our way to where we, we've gotten so far in the past year. And, even though we did some tours like with bands that Under Oath has toured with, even though we didn't fit in, it was fun to, uh, you know, to prove to some of the people that haven't heard Free Wave or wouldn't listen to it because it wasn't metal or, or whatever it was, whatever the reasoning was, it was great to be out there with some friends like Norma Jean and just prove ourselves. And every show we played, we ended up leaving with a lot of new fans. And I think that's cool. It was a good year. And you have an incredibly wild show. I mean, I was really yeah, taken back. <laughs> Sleepwave is uh, about as heavy as you can get without being like a screaming double bass breakdown band. They, they, all the guys are go, uh, you know, we have a talk every day. We're like, you know, there's always going to be someone younger, better, faster, quicker, you know, just like in sports and, you know, anything in the entertainment industry, like you got to go as if this was your last show on, on the face of the planet, whether it's five people or 5,000 people and, you know, pretty much every guy in the band holds that, you know, pretty strongly to what we do. So you're making yourself sound like you're old. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I'm just saying that I think there's always competition out there. I think, you know, like there's people standing in the crowd that might be a better guitar player than the player on stage. You know, there's always someone that would give their left arm to be where you are when you're on that stage. And I think just not taking that for granted is more what Sleep Waves Live show was all about. It's just, you know, be really appreciative of the opportunity and just go for it.
I suppose everything has really changed for you now because Under Oath is coming back together for a new tour. But the band breakup in 2013, that must have been brutal for you. I mean, here you are, yeah. you'd already put a decade of your life into the band. For me, that would have been really depressing. Yeah, it was, it was man. I, I think it was harder than I realized it was going to be. Like when I was younger and when Under Oath first started, I used to get a lot of anxiety, like sleeping at night. I would, I would be like, well, what if... What if I wake up and no one wants to do this anymore? I'm, you know, I'm screwed. You know, I didn't go to college. You know, you worry about stuff, you know, when I was like 19 or whatever, and just be kind of like stressed that all my friends were going to college and getting jobs. And I was like traveling around in a van, you know, but I loved it. And, and, you know, that never deterred me from like the path that I envisioned for the band and where we were going to go and the things we were going to do, but it's still like a lot. And then a decade passes and it happens and at this point, you're more concerned that you have a mortgage and you have a life and you have bills. You know, you're established in a career that you've been in for 10 plus years. You know, that ending is is almost as crazy as the idea of like being a younger kid not going to college and stuff. It was uh, about as brutal as, as I thought anything like that would be. Like you go through all the stages. I think I was angry. I think I was depressed. I think I was, you know, hurt. All all the different emotions that you would feel from, I could imagine any sort of breakup. It's almost like maybe like a divorce. I don't know. I've never been married, but I can only imagine being with someone for 10 years and then just going, all right, it's over. And in this case for Under Oath, you know, we've buried the hatchet over the, the past couple of years of being broken up, but we were all best friends, you know, when we started. And as you become a man and, and an individual, you kind of drift apart over time. And, and then the breakup happens, you know, for some of us, we wanted to keep going and the other people didn't want. And I was one of the people that was still wanting to keep the band going. And then when, you know, the other guys said they wouldn't do it, it was just how it was going to be, you know, but that was, that was a tough time in my life. And I definitely, you know, went through a, a long array of emotions and stuff. <laughs> well, then, really, was creating Sleepwave with you and Stephen, was that really a help to you on a personal yeah, level? Yeah, it, it was very therapeutic. Um, I was writing music for the follow-up to Disambiguation. Because a lot of times, you know, people like me and Tim, we would write on our own, and the band would get together, and we'd write together, as far as Under Oath goes. And I was also writing uh, some stuff it was different. It didn't sound like under a, you know, I write music all the time for fun. It's just what I do. You know, like I'm a songwriter. I, I play an instrument every single day, you know, but I had this stuff that I was kind of like digging and I sat down with my friend, Steven, who has a studio and started tracking it. And then he started adding ideas to it and we would just kind of like mess around, you know, have fun. And then I, all right, gotta go. I'm going on tour, you know, I'll see you in a month. And then I came back, I'm like, man, things aren't going so well. You know, like, you want to hang out? We'll, you know, grab a beer or something. And you know, my friend and talk to me, like, I don't know what's going on with my band. And we end up hanging out. And then we go back to his studio and pick up some instruments and just play for fun, you know? And then all of a sudden, we kind of looked at it and like, you know what? These, like, fun ideas are kind of sounding like really rad songs. Like, maybe we should, you know, focus a little bit on this. And we started doing that. And I was super busy with Under Earth in and out. And, you know, when I'd come back, you know, he'd stop what he was doing and I'd stop what I was doing. We start messing around with music. And then I remember exactly where we were when the guy said that this was going to be the last tour. At this point, there wasn't going to be a farewell tour. I remember calling him. And I was like, hey, uh, <laughs> you remember those ideas we have uh, on your computer and on my computer? Yeah. Do you want to spend a little more time on those and make them into some really good songs? And he was like, yeah, of course, man. I thought that's what we were doing. I was like, yeah, but now we can like really do that because everyone in Under Oath just basically said they're done. And that was a huge like turning point. And it was exciting to work on new music, but still depressing at the same time because of what was going on with my other group of friends. So, uh, yeah, but it was therapeutic to get through all that. And a lot of that aggression that needed to get out and the frustration and the hurt was definitely put in that first record.
seconds have turned to one There's no turning back tonight Kiss me one last time dangerous business walking out your front door. Well, Sound of Sleep Wave is really interesting because besides your voice, it's very different from Under Oath. Very, yeah. Was this intentional or was this organic trying to look for a different sound? It was. It's very organic for me. Like, I've always been a rock guy. I mean, I grew up on it. You know, my dad showed me the Beatles was the first thing I ever heard. And then I had to listen to Led Zeppelin and <laughs> Pink Floyd and Jimi Hendrix and The Doors and The Rolling Stones. And I wasn't allowed to listen to anything else until I was old enough to pay for my own music. And then I got into Nirvana and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and, uh, you know, that whole era. of it. And it was always about melody and, and then the guitar work and Later, getting into like Nine Smells and the Deftones, and that brings you over towards some of the heavier stuff like Poison the Well and some of the early stuff that we got into and Hope's Fall and all that back in the day, and that brings you to the metal world. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty organic for me to write songs. You know, I've been in bands my whole life. You know, I've been in punk bands, I've been in rock bands, I've been in piano rock bands, I've been in metal bands. You know, like I just happens to be one of them stuck around for a while and like people liked it and that one was under oath and i love music and i love writing it and i would love writing it with people and i love writing it by myself you know we were like 19 years old when when i started practicing with under oath and it just made sense so we went with it and then it was like wow this is like happening and it happened so fast and it happened so organically and and you're so busy you don't really realize that you haven't stopped to take a breath yet before you know it you're you're headlining shows and it happens really fast uh but yeah, I mean, I think I don't really have to try. I think even if I wrote a new Under Oath record with the guys, picking up a guitar, being in the same room with Tim, we would probably write riffs that sound like Under Oath because we bring that out in each other. You know, like me and Aaron sitting in a room together, we have a competitive nature. I mean, we're best friends. 
but we push each other. It's like, well, I'm going to do this. You're going to do that. You're going to do this. I'm going to do that. We like would really push each other. I think that naturally would just come out. And I don't think we've ever really had to try to do anything. And I think the same thing with sleep wave is I said, no, I'm the, I, was, I wasn't going to scream at all on the record. Cause you know, it's a rock band and there's still moments on the record where there's some screaming and stuff just because it was, was called for. It felt right in the song, you know? Yeah. I think it's just kind of letting the song take shape. You know, I've definitely written a lot of songs for both bands that I wanted to finish just to finish knowing that they probably weren't going to make the record for the, for a broken compass that I wrote, you know, we'd be like the verse on the chorus and I'd be like, this is just a little too much or a little too, we're just like having fun with it though. We'd finish the song and then we sit back and listen to it. And like, yeah, hey, cool song. Doesn't really sound like sleep wave. So let's just put it in the back burner, you know, like huh. put it on a hard drive somewhere. Well, at times I was wondering on Broken Compass if you wouldn't even drop into disco because you had the one song, Whole Again. It's virtually a club dance track blended into a rock yeah. song. You know, that's very in- inspired by, um, you know, I've always been a Nine Snails fan. And I've always looked at the Trent Reznor and I wanted to start a song completely electronic and have the heaviest thing in the song be a keyboard, which is all that wah you know, all those verses and stuff. Like if you listen to that in a good PA or a good sound system in your car, it's heavy. And uh, that song took a long time to create all the electronics on it, but that was kind of a project song that ended up making the record. That was a idea of like, Hey, you know, what if we start a song that literally has no guitars until the chorus comes in? And, you know, I think at the time also, I think when Nine Snows came back, they released that record was very heavily electronic and, I heard that and was like, dude, this is totally doable. They're doing what we started working on a couple months ago. Like, I don't know, I was just inspired by that, the idea of a completely electronic song for the most part. And a lot of those elements shine through on the record and and probably some in the future as well. I, you know, I'll do that sometimes. I'm like, you know, I wrote a song on guitar and I'm going to take the guitar, I'm going to mute the guitar and see if I can make this song work without guitar and then add the guitar in later as a layer you know, you work backwards, just like sometimes I'll write a song on the piano and then transfer it over the guitar and get a drum kit behind it and speed it up a little bit. Turns out to be the heaviest song on the record. You know, like you never know.
interesting that you bring up about Nine Inch Nails because Sleep Leave gets constant comparisons to that. I mean, here are some of the similarities. Of course, big difference is you can actually sing and Trent Reznor really doesn't. But, <laughs> you know, are you cool with having that kind of comparison made? I think it's a cool comparison. Do I think we sound like Nine Inch Nails? No. Would I like to? Sure. I think they're an awesome band and I think they're really cool, especially the rock stuff. The stuff that's more like the Fragile Era and the With Teeth Era, I think, are, are awesome. But I still listen to that stuff. Do I think we sound like that? I think we're way poppier and we're way more song structure rock based. Like you can hear the mm-hmm. the Beatles and Who influence more so. I mean, I didn't even notice that until David Bendis, who made the record, and he, you know, he's an older guy in his sixties. And I, I want to say, don't don't quote me on that. I don't want him to hear this and get mad at me. I'm not sure his age. <laughs> he's an older dude. He's been in this industry for a long time, and he grew up, you know, going to see Jimi Hendrix and bands like that. So, I mean, he would pause the vocal take sometimes. He's like, you know, you're doing this psychedelic, like, 60s thing, right? I'm like, (laughs) no. He's just like, it sounds like the Who's melodies. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I grew up on that stuff. He's like, it must be instilled in you somewhere in the back of your brain because you grew up and your dad made you listen to all that 60s music. And I was like, I guess so, because I don't really, it's not what I'm going for, but I'm just doing what it feels right. So, yeah, I think comparing us to Nine Inch Nails, I think on the electronic aggressive side at some points, yes. I think that's that's a proper comparison, but it, we get compared to, you know, other people will say, well, you guys sound like 30 Seconds to Mars. And I'm like, oh, I see it's a rock band that sings a lot in a higher register with electronics. Yes, we do that as well. But do we sound really sound like 30 Seconds to Mars? No, not really. Nor do we Nine Inch Nails. But if you took the two and put them together and had a baby, maybe... I don't know. You know, I, I think that's one of the weird things about Sleep Wave is you can't really put your finger on who we sound like because we just sound like ourselves. And I think that's cool. But it also hurts us at the same time because, you know, who are we supposed to tour with? <laughs> <laughs> Here it comes, the title track from Sleep Wave's Broken Compass album.
but read a quote from you, Spencer, where you said, music is an escape, but it's noise when the overall content is cheap. So really, what does it take for an artist to produce songs that are truly creative? You know, I think being being yourself, when Under Oath started, we were rebelling. Uh, you know, it was more of a, a movement and a rebellion against the mainstream and against the state of where music was at at the time. And uh, that wasn't the only driving force behind it, but that was part of it. And we were writing our own songs and we were playing our own instruments and singing our own lyrics, you know, like, and now you've got bands in that genre that are doing what all the big pop and country and mainstream artists are doing, and they're hiring other people to do it for them. And I think, you know, just being true to yourself and doing it because you love it makes it not just a bunch of noise. You can make a song out of that. And I hear it, even in some modern bands, you know, I hear some of these bands that that I think, wow, you know, it might not be my thing, but that sounds like nothing else, you know, and they're doing their thing and it's good. They're being themselves. It sounds like they're being honest. As far as I can tell, someone asked me the other day, um, who's looking to work with sleep wave goes, you know, tell me what sets you apart from all the other singers and what's going to make you stay around and, and last and be a star. And blah, blah, blah. you know, I was like, well, first of all, I don't do any of this to be a star because I think that's the wrong reason to do anything. So first of all, your, your question is already wrong, but I'll still answer it. And I think the difference between me and other people is, is I do this because I love it and I do it because I believe in it and I believe in every word I say. And I think some of these quote unquote stars, whatever you want to call them, these big artists, not all of them. I definitely want to make sure that's clear that I'm not talking about everybody, but I definitely think there's a handful and a few that I know of that aren't writing their own songs and they aren't writing their own lyrics. And there's a producer or a songwriter involved completely, you know, to, to collab with a songwriter or to collab with a producer. It's totally fine. But I mean, you're telling me that there's a band up there and he's singing the words that he doesn't care about, that he didn't write, that he doesn't believe in in front of 5,000 people, is that very hard? No, it's probably not very hard. But what happens when, like all bands, they go up and down, up and down. So what happens the next year they come back and the venue sold 75% of ticket sales or 50% of ticket sales? Well, what happens when they sell 10% of ticket sales? You're telling me that kid is going to stand up there and, and believe in the words that he's saying in front of 100 people, 50 people, 25 people? Because that shit does happen. And it's okay that that happens. Like, but if you're not writing it yourself and you have a wall at all, you're you're going to see straight through it, in my opinion. And I just tell people the difference between me and everyone else is I'm I'm real. I'm the things I think about are me. You know, like that's me up there. Like it's not an act. It's not a gimmick. And I'm not singing other people's words. I'm singing what I believe in and what I've gone through and what I say. And they're my songs. You know, and I think that eventually shines through. Then to follow along with that, would you say that your lyrics have a particular focus or a message? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I feel like every song is, is a different journey, but like to me, it's it's more, I, I write from the heart about things that I've gone through and growing up and the way music was to me is that it was the things I connected with were the honest vocalists and songwriters that it makes you feel like you're not alone in the world because everyone at different points feels completely alone, you know, be it in their, you know, teens or twenties or thirties, or I'm sure even forties, like when people go through divorces or whatever is going on in your life, there's times where you feel completely alone and hurt or scared. And I think when you write honest songs from the heart, like that's what music is for. People love music because they connect to it. And I think all my songs are even the really dark ones are there's a little bit of hope behind it is that you're not alone. And I think that's just kind of how I live my life. You know, I'm just pretty transparent and just, I'll tell it how it is. You might catch me on a good day or a bad day or a good year or a bad year or, you know, who knows, but I'm pretty damn honest about everything at least. Maybe we, why don't
Spencer spoke about writing lyrics, so what could be more appropriate than airing writing on the walls from Under Oath? Back to the point about your style of music with Sleepwave. One of the songs on Sleepwave's debut album, Broken Compass, is called Rock and Roll is Dead and So Am I. What about the style itself? Do you think that rock and roll could be considered a dying art form? Um, I don't think it'll ever die. I, I really don't. I think whether it's it goes back to the small clubs like it has, or it's going to take over the world again, which I'm sure it will. Uh, at the time when I wrote that song, you know, it was about more of a state of where I was, and the title is more of a state of where everyone else was. And I was actually shopping Sleepwave around, and... I went into a major label. It flew me up. They wanted to meet me and they wanted to know, you know, different stuff about what I was going to do with this project. I stepped down in the office and this dude that was a, just a complete asshole, you know, he was not nice. He was trying to intimidate me. And one question he asked me is, what am I worth? <laughs> I said, excuse me? Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> you know, what are you, what? Like, is this a joke? And he's like, what are you worth? What are you worth as a ticket sale? What will your fans pay to see you to shake your hand? What can you charge for someone to see you? And I just laughed. I was like, oh. you're going to measure my self-worth on ticket sales and what kids would pay to see me. I would never make anyone pay to see me. I think it's right to pay to see a band perform because there's a lot of money that goes into it. And that's how music is made and continues to be made, especially when no one's buying CDs or music anymore. But it's my, what's my worth based on ticket sales? I just thought it was a joke. And the other comment he made while he's like, I love the band. I love this. He's like, but what do you want me to do with this? There's guitars. And I said, what? <laughs> there's guitars in this. And I said, well, that's where it is. You know, my phone number, you flew me up here. So if you want to talk, hit me up. And I just walked out and, uh, that song is, it's not about him or anything about that, but it was kind of about the state of where I was and the state in my mind. And I named that song that because I was just so angry at, at that guy. It's kind of more of a, middle finger of like obviously i'm not dead and neither is rock and roll but it's just like that's what it feels like when someone's putting a, a price on your head and on the things that you do isn't it guys like that that are really creating the biggest issues in the record industry do i think they are yeah i i yes i think they are like any big business i feel like some of the older guys high up in the corporate offices that are used to the way that business used to be ran before markets crashed and things went south and, you know, people don't have the money they used to, but some of these rich high up people at these big businesses do, and they're still trying to run big business, the old, and it's definitely been changing and there, there's a new way to run business and a new way to, to go about things. And I think they just keep doing the same thing. That's why we keep running into this year's new pop star and pop song and they go accept an award and you hear the pop artist list off 25 people who helped to write that one song that's already been written 600 times. <laughs> that's not what we're a part of, you know, we're a part of a rock and roll genre and a for on the road to metal genre. And, it's, and I'm glad to not be a part of that world, but I'm sure it's like that in every business somewhere along the lines. Well, at least you're still creating and being creative. I read on Facebook yeah, that, absolutely. Sleep, that Sleepwave's got a new album planned for 2016. Yeah, I'm, I'm technically I'm halfway done writing it, but I like to write double. So I'm about a quarter of the way. Um, like I told you earlier before the interview, I'm in the process of moving. And once I get settled, I'm going to do another writing block. Uh, hopefully be done writing it before I leave for the Underworld tour and be right in the studio basically the day I get home I'm I'm going to go right in and try to track everything I've demoed a lot of new sleepwave stuff over the last uh year which is crazy because we've been on tour all year and I remember <laughs> my manager going where where the hell did you have time to do this and I said well this is what I do I don't know I was you know like we we go home for 3 days here 3 days there 7 days here and we just wouldn't go home we just go to like a studio and, and demo out new stuff it was fun. It was it was a busy year, though. Yo, what's up? This is Spencer Chamberlain from Sleepwave, and you're listening to The Antidote. Where I stay Did you see this coming? 
now you're going to do this huge, I guess, almost sold out spring tour with Under Oath. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's all sold out. If it's not, it's going to be sold out before we leave. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, it's like I have two bands to express different sides of myself with. And, you know, I people ask about Under Oath, like, so what's going to happen? Is Sleepwave going to stop? And the answer is no. Sleepwave will continue to be full time. You know, everyone in Under Oath has other things going on in their life. And I think us learning to be friends again, which I credit a lot of that to the DVD that we released that took two years too long to release yeah. uh, <laughs> about the farewell tour, that company that was putting it together, that it folded. So we had to finish it. And that means we had to talk. And two years of making that and talking, you know, it's like we're kind of learning how to be friends again. And I think a balance between that and under a fan base being as active as they were on the farewell tour still to this very day without a lull. I'd sign into the Twitter and just scroll through and it'd be like thousands of comments an hour about how they people missing under oath for the whole three years we were gone. You know, it never stopped. All of a sudden it's just kind of like we owe it to our fans and to ourselves to do a tour. And then we decided to play both records on the tour to find the Great Lines turning 10 and Chasing Safety is already turned 10. We missed that. So we're like, well, let's do both. You, everyone had to do the same thing. There's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. and We were constantly told that we needed to tour, 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 tour. And that band's kind of the size where you don't have to tour 10 months out of the year. It has its fan base. It's not going anywhere. Those fans are die hard, and we don't have to tour 10 months out of the year. We can do one tour a year in each country and keep everyone happy, you know, and, and ourselves. And then kids ask like will we make another record maybe i don't know i'm i'm sure we'll write stuff but will it come out i don't know like i told the guys if we do release something it's got to be better than anything we've ever done hands down it's got to be the best thing the world has ever heard and i think the band is capable of that if you know if it comes together organically and honestly we we take time doing it but only time will tell I think Under Oath is at the, at the point where it's taking it one step at a time. And it's like, look, we, we got a tour. Everyone gets a chance to see the band again, and we're going to play two full records. And that's the first step. So, like, we'll see what happens after that, you know? And I know that we that the hiatus has been lifted. Like, we're we're open to doing more things. But it's not going to be full time because everyone has, they all have families and jobs. And, you know, Aaron's doing Paramore and I'm doing Sleep Wave. It's, But it's cool. It's still an option that that band can still exist, you know? It doesn't have to be turned off completely. I think that's cool. Well, I've got a great way for you to keep both Sleepwave and Under Oath fans happy. Why doesn't Sleepwave be the opener for Under Oath on the tour? (laughs) Because that would be me singing three records in a row, (laughs) six (laughs) nights a week. That would be way too much. It's a lot of work to do two records back to back, but, uh, you know, I haven't stopped touring, so I'm good. But, man, if you had a third record in there that you're looking at, like, two and a half hours of singing and screaming back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, be brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer Chamberlain has been here with The Antidote. Man, it's been really great to speak with you. So, listen, have yeah, fun man. with the uh, Under Oath Tour, and best of luck with the upcoming Sleepwave album. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we'll talk again soon around that new Sleepwave record, and maybe I'll see you out at the Unrose, uh tour. Absolutely. Cool. Well, let's speak soon, man. I'll keep in touch. Absolutely great to have Spencer Chamberlain on The Antidote. And thank you for listening in. I still think my idea of having Sleepwave open for Under Oath would have been awesome, but I guess Spencer's right. It would have destroyed his voice. And I'm going to dash any hope you might have had for finding tickets to Under Oath's Toronto show. After the interview ended, Spencer told me that all 1,300 tickets at the Phoenix sold out in less than three minutes. And that they could have sold the night out six times over. Uh, I guess maybe next time. (laughs) On to what's happening next week when Lacey Sturm, formerly of Flyleaf, one of the greatest vocalists ever, brings her new solo album, Life Screams, to the antidote. Love the album title, because Lacey really does have that perfect scream. We're going to close off the show with another hit from Under Oath's Define the Great Line release, In Regards to Myself. See you next week. <laughs>